We are continuing in the stories that we begin since the beginning of the month. And we have been talking about pulling down the strongholds. We started by talking about the reality of what strongholds are. In other words, strongholds are not something that this African man came up with. They are something that has always been in the scriptures. And we've talked about it. We established the, the reality of those strongholds. In our very first installment, we talked about what strongholds are. We talked about that they are a fortified place to protect against every and you know, to protect against the attack uh, against an attack. We asked the question, what are you know what why are stronghold built in the first place? Uh, we said stronghold are built to be able to be able to provide leverage. Uh, we said stronghold provide a power to control and influence enemy territory. In other words, the enemy builds a stronghold with the intention to be able to infiltrate uh, and to be able to control whatever territory they find themselves. We a stronghold give the enemy the power to control and to influence. In our second installment two weeks ago, we started by we, talk, we started talking about we started talking about a specific stronghold, and the specific stronghold that we looked at was the stronghold of anger. We talked about the destructive element of anger and the impact of anger, and we said that the enemy knows that when anger consumes you. When you are controlled by anger, when anger has a hold over your life, the enemy is able to take advantage of you. We said that they, 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 that's where the enemy knows that when anger, when you are controlled by anger, you lose control, and the enemy can shape your life the way he wants it to be. You know, shape your life the way he wants it to be. Last week we started talking about an unusual stronghold, of which most people don't think about this. But that's why I say it's unusual. The unusual stronghold of fatherlessness, and we said that because a lot of people do not pay attention even to this particular stronghold, this stronghold has devastated family. It has destroyed a lot of people, and we say that the, the, the stronghold of fatherlessness is so dangerous because it not does not it does not only affect one individual. It affects the children, it affects the family. The reason is because fathers are in, you know, fathers are central to the stability of the family. Okay? Fathers are central to the stability of family. And we, and, the, and we said that the enemy knows that when the fathers and the children are separated, when the fathers are not united to their children, when the fathers are absent to their parents, you, what you find is that a lot of things go wrong in the family. When the fathers are not doing what they are supposed to do, when the fathers are not involved in the life of their children, when the fathers are absent, we said a lot of things go wrong in the life of that family. And we close our time together by saying that the only way we can move forward is to be able to destroy that particular stronghold of fatherlessness in our society. This morning we are going, are going to be looking at another kind of stronghold that has held the family, that has held the society, you know, in a, you know, in a chokehold that is plaguing our culture right now. And we're talking about the stronghold of unforgiveness. The stronghold of unforgiveness. In the book of Matthew chapter 18 that we read in the time of our Bible reading, the Bible makes us to understand that there was a certain king, a certain ruler, a certain rich man, a certain big boy. The Bible says that this man had a lot of people who owed him money. And then he decided to call them together to settle his account. And as he was settling the account, one of his servants came to him and said, Father, Master, I do not have the means to be able to pay you back. And then the master, the, the, the Bible says that that particular king said, okay, go and lock him up until he's able to pay. Sell him until he's able to pay. The man kept on begging and this man, this king had compassion upon him and he released him. And the Bible goes on to say that this same guy that just enjoyed the forgiveness of his master, the Bible tells us that this same guy now decided to hold, you know, to, to take a hold on an individual who owed him money. Let's pick up the story from verse number 18. Matthew chapter 29, Matthew, sorry, Matthew 18, reading from verse number 29. The Bible says, so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not. That is, the guy that received forgiveness will not forgive another person. And he will not. But went and threw him in jail till he could pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master what had been done. Then his master, after, and then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servants, I forgive you all the debt because, because you begged me. 
Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I pitied you? Do you notice that the master was not saying forgive is there. The master was not saying right off. He said, he said have, you know, have pity. You know, have pity on that particular person. Shouldn't you have just had compassion on your fellow servants? Verse number 34. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturer until he should pay all that was due to him. Now verse number 35. The Bible says, So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. From this verse of scripture, I'm going to just highlight a quickly uh, a, a number of things before we go on. The first thing you see here is that there is a certainty of offense. Certainty of offense. In other words, as you travel through the road of life, somebody somewhere will do something that will piss you off. Somebody somewhere will do something that will make you angry. Somebody somewhere will step on your toes. They will do something that you are not happy with. You are going to be offended. That is the certainty of life. When this man was giving money to all these people, the, the assurance was that they were going to get his money back. But for some reason, they could not pay. And then when the accounting came, he had to be able to make a choice. Do I continue to stick to the guns of collecting my money or do I have compassion on these people? The first thing you see from that verse of scripture we've read is that there's going to be offense in life. If you go about life thinking that nobody's going to offend you, you are not living in reality. Somebody's going to make you angry. Number two that we see is there's going to be, always be a request for forgiveness. In other words, the people that offend you, they are going to ask you for forgiveness. You are going to offend somebody and you are going to ask for forgiveness. The reality is that life is going to be full of offenses. There will always be a request for forgiveness and there is going to be the danger of refusal. You might be tempted to say no. When people walk against you, when people do things against you, there's a tendency that you are so hurt that you make up your mind and say, no, I will never forgive you. And people have said that. They said, I will never forgive you. But if you flip the shoes around and you stay in the side of the person who is the one who committed the offense, and you go and you seek for forgiveness, just like this man did, he asked for forgiveness from his master. He got that forgiveness. But when the time came for him to extend that forgiveness, he refused. So there is, number one, the reality, the certainty that offense will come. The number two thing is that there's going to be always the need to forgive. Then there's going to be the possibility of refusal. And then there is the danger of unforgiveness. Look at verse number 31. The Bible says, so when, so when his fellow servants saw that what had been done, they were grieved. In other words, when you have the, when there is a request for forgiveness, when somebody says, yes, I realize I've made a mistake, and I'm asking you to forgive me, and you refuse, there is always a grieving of the spirit that takes place. Because you wound that spirit when you refuse to let go. Not just when you are the one who refuses, who is refusing to give, is refusing to extend forgiveness. Even when forgiveness is not given to you, there is something that happens inside your spirit. There is a grieving that takes place in your spirit and you begin to say, why won't you forgive me? So you see, number one, the reality, the certainty of offense. Number two, the request for forgiveness. Number three, the possibility of a refusal. Number four, the danger of unforgiveness. And number five, there's always a consequence for, for, for unforgiveness. When you refuse to forgive, it doesn't end the story. I want you to understand that. When you refuse to forgive another person, that does not mean that is the end of the story. The Bible makes us to understand that if you do not forgive, do not expect to be forgiven. And it's not just between you and your fellow man. God himself takes note of those kind of things. God himself pays attention to those kind of things. He said, if you refuse to forgive, our Father in heaven also will not forgive. So my brothers and sisters, we live in a very interesting time. And the reason we are talking about this particular thing at this time around now is because we live in a very, very unforgiving society. Our culture is so unforgiving, especially now in the Me Too movement, where everybody wakes up one day and remember what has been done to them 500 years ago, and they want to punish that person today. We live in an unforgiving society. Our society is a society that keeps a very good record of wrongdoing. They keep a very good record of undoing. And please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that the society should not keep record of criminals. I'm not saying society should not keep record of people who are misbehaving. 
Because as if, if you, unless you do that, you cannot protect law abiding citizens if you don't keep record. If we don't know the people who are the troublemakers in our society and we're able to make sure that they pay for their sins, if we don't know how to do that, our society will be lawless. But what I am talking about this morning is that a society that keeps record of wrongdoing for the purpose of revenge, a society that keeps record of wrongdoing for the purpose of destroying the other person, a society that keeps a record of wrongdoing so that they can make sure the other person does not make for, move forward, is a society ready to create or to, to destroy itself. There is a problem when a society keeps record just for the sake of destroying one another. There's a problem. I have often joked, you know, for, for those who are close to me, you notice I, I always say something about the fact that if you are running for office, take for example, you are running for the office of a dog catcher, okay? You want to be the chief dog catcher in the city. And for some reason, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you took your chihuahua out and you are going for a walk. And your chihuahua decided to take a stool, okay? And you forgot to bring that your nice looking things. You know how interesting thing? People don't want to clean the poop of their daughters and their sons, but they would like to pack the poop of dogs on the street. But that's a story for another day. Anyway, they, you forget to take your nylon bag to pack the poop of your chihuahua. Or you packed it and you refused to dump it properly. And some yahoo somewhere saw you that you did not pick up the poop of your chihuahua or you dumped it in the wrong place. The day that you announce that you want to be the chief dog catcher in your community, that is the day that that video will come out. That you did not dispose of your poop of the poop of your dog properly, or you did not pack your poop the poop of your chihuahua when you were going. The point I am trying to make is this: people are now looking for the offense of other people with the intention to destroy. And let me repeat myself: I am not saying that the society should not hold people accountable. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that when we hold things with, with the intention to destroy our fellow man, when we hold on to offense with the intention to be able to use it to destroy their lives, their family, and their livelihood, there is a problem. And before long, we are going to destroy ourselves. If you hold on to an offense for your brother, for your sister, your wife, or your co-worker, or, your com or, your, or the members of the church, you hold an offense against them with the intention of looking for the right time to use that offense to whack their head, we will soon destroy ourselves in the process. Because offense, you know, when you do unforgiveness, it doesn't just end with you. It has this multiplier effect. The point I'm making is that we live in a very unforgiving society. And the result of this very destructive spirit of unforgiveness in our culture is evident in the way that we are now a very polarized society. Polarized society in the sense that nobody wants to talk to each other. The one who thinks that is right and the one who thinks that is not, you know, those two people don't want to talk because everybody wants to be right. Because as a result of our corrosive tendency of not letting things go, it has seen in the way that the groups of the groups in our society refuse to talk to each other. Husband and wife refusing to forgive, children refusing to forgive their parents. And you see that the, a marriage relationship that started with love now ends up with people trying to not just separate but tear themselves apart. They will now take their own children children and use it as a weapon against one another. That is the result of unforgiveness that is going on in our society. And if this unforgiving spirit is transferred to the life of an individual, that individual, that life, the life of that individual becomes very, very toxic. When that particular, when families live a life of unforgiveness, what you find is that there is a family breakup. Because if I offend my brother and I offend my sister and we refuse to forgive one another, relationship cannot thrive. The family unit will break up. If you see it in the church, the church will break up. When people refuse to let go, the family unit will break up. When individuals live a life of unforgiveness, you will see that they become disconnected. Nobody wants to associate with somebody that continues to bring up the mistake that they made 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago or just yesterday. Every minute I say, I am sorry, you will bring up something because you want to use it as a weapon. When such things happen, people live in disconnection and isolation because nobody wants to relate with you. Apart from the disconnection and the isolation, individuals who live a life of unforgiveness become very bitter and they become very angry. Because they don't have their way. 
they want to be able to control the other person. And when they are not able to control you by holding grudge against you, they become angry and they become bitter. And what you see, the result of that is loneliness and depression. That's why mental health cases are becoming very rampant. That's why people are beginning to seek help from the, from the streets. Because unforgiveness results in loneliness and depression. And, more, you know, and the more depressed and lonely people become, the more meaningless life becomes. And that's why the rate of suicide is gradually going up. And it's not just suicide among adults. It's suicide among children. When children don't know how to let go. When children don't know how to forgive. When children don't know how to be able to move on. You'll find that life become depressing and lonely. And as a result of loneliness and depression, you'll find that life become meaningless. And when people become meaningless, they begin to do stupid things. All because they will not forgive. All because they will not let go. Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Reading from verse number reading from verse number 14. Hebrews 12 reading from verse number 14. The Bible says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. I want you to look at the underlying one. Lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you by the very and by this many become defiled. When you keep bottling these things up, when you keep holding on to the things that are not supposed to be held on to, when you refuse to let go, the Bible said that you plant a seed of bitterness in your spirit. And when that spirit of bitterness begins to take root, you will find out that it will defile everything you do. It comes out in your word. It comes out in your action. It comes out in everything you do. Your relationship becomes toxic just because you will not let go of the things that you're supposed to do. The Bible is simply telling us, let go. Say, live in peace. Forgive. That's what the Bible is saying. Do not hold on to the past or else you are planting a seed that will destroy, that will trouble, and that will mess up everything you put your hands into. Now, the interesting thing about this story about forgiveness is that if this unforgiveness is found only outside the church, it is not okay, but at least it is understandable. Understandable in the sense that we can say that because they don't know the love of God, that's why they are not forgiven. All right? If it is happening outside with the people who don't call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can explain it. We say, yes, they have not known the, they have not known the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has given to them on the cross of Calvary. But if individuals who say that they have enjoyed the love of God, who say that they have received the forgiveness for their sins, who say they have been redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary, if those same individuals are not forgiven, there is a problem. It's either they have not met or experienced the forgiveness of Christ or they experienced or they met the wrong Jesus. Because there's no way you can, there's no way you can, you can, you can, you can explain a person who says he has received forgiveness from God and yet is living in unforgiveness. Like I said, the unfortunate thing is that the same unforgiving spirit that is seen outside the church is seen inside the church. And many within the church are suffering in every department of their life. They are suffering in different areas of their life because they simply refuse to let go. And the question is why? Why wouldn't they let go? Why is unforgiveness so rampant in our culture? Why is unforgiveness so common in the church? Why is that people find it very difficult to let go? To answer that particular question, you must first of all understand what, forgi what unforgiveness is. When we say unforgiveness, what are we talking about? I will use a story in the Bible to be able to illustrate it. Genesis chapter 20, 27. Genesis 27, reading from verse number 41, the Bible tells us. It says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of my mourning, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother. Many of us who have been in church long enough know the story of uh, Jacob and Esau. 
Bible makes us to understand that there was a guy called Jacob, he got married to a woman called Rebecca, called, 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 sorry, there was a guy called Isaac, he got married to a woman called uh, Rebecca, he was the son of Abraham, and then they had two sons, there was a prophecy that the elder would serve the younger, and there was a rivalry between the two boys, uh, and that rivalry, the, the time came, uh, that when Isaac wanted to give his patriarchal blessings to move to the next generation, Isaac, Jacob heard about it, schemed with the mother, stole the blessing, and when he did that, Jacob, you know, Esau was very, very angry. And Esau made a promise and said, I was going to deal with you. And because of the stealing of the blessing, Esau now realized that he had lost what was very important to him. The Bible says Esau wept. He begged his father and said, bless me. But it was too late. You all know the story of Jacob and Esau. And that is the backdrop for that verse. Genesis 27, reading from verse number 41. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of my mourning, the days of mourning for my father is at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. In other words, Esau was saying, you have done your own. I am coming for you. I will not forgive you. You have stole from me. My father will soon die and I will get my pound of flesh. I will get my revenge. So in other words, what is unforgiveness? Number one, unforgiveness is a conscious decision. That's what it means. I want you to look at the verse of the scripture in that verse number 41 of Genesis 27. You will notice, if you put it on the screen, you notice I underlined it. And Esau said in his heart. Esau said in his heart. In other words, he made up his mind. This guy you stole from me. You did something that really, really touched the nerve of my being. You really did something that hurt me. And I will not let it go. He said, Esau said in his heart. That means Esau made up his mind. Esau made a conscious decision that I will not let you go. He made a decision that he will do, he will, he will, he will react to Je what Jacob had done to him. Esau made a conscious decision to hold on to the offense of his brother until such a time when he's able to fight. So you see, unforgiveness is a decision. You make up your mind that this is what I want to do. I am not going to let it go. That is a decision. And that is what unforgiveness is. Number two, unforgiveness is a determination that I will not let this thing go. There is a night where you make a decision and you say, okay, I will not do something and then somebody can convince you other one. But when you are living in unforgiveness, there is a determination that you have made in your mind that I will not let it go. The Bible said the days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I will. That's a statement of determination. I will slay my brother Jacob. So Esau made a deliberate, determined decision not to let go. That day, I don't know, he was saying, Jacob, you think you have gotten away with this at this point in time, but I am waiting for you. I have made up my mind. I'm not going to let you get away with this. Number three, what is unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is a conscious decision to hold on to. Number one is to not to let go, but the other one is to hold on to. There is another one to say, I can let go, but I will not, you know, I will not continue to remember. But Esau made up his mind, he will continue to remember. And that was why if you begin to read the book of Exodus, it's only the book of Genesis chapter 32, when eventually two of them met, he came with 400 men. Were it not for the prayer of Jacob, Esau was determined. 20 years after, Esau was still pissed. Because he, was made, he has made up his mind, he was going to deal with this guy. So it's a decision to hold on to a grudge, no matter how long. Esau was saying, I may not have the means to deal with you right now. I may not have the power to be able to do it. The conditions may not be right, but I will get my revenge. The time is coming, I will get my revenge. It is basically what unforgiveness is all about. A decision of the will to hold a grudge against someone who has offended us until we are able to seek revenge? That's basically what it is. And it doesn't take, it doesn't matter how long it takes. The more you keep repeating, you keep, and then you notice, look at the nations that fight each other. Look at the cultures that fight each other. Look at the race that have wanted against each other. You begin to wonder, what has that person done to you? You cannot explain it. But it has been transferred from one generation to the other, to the other, to the other, because there is an unforgiving spirit that has taken place. And I remember one man of God saying to another particular person of a different faith. He said, as long as we are not willing to forgive, we will continue to send our sons and daughter to die on the altar of what they have no clue how it started. And that is what is happening. 
when we do when we refuse to forgive a lot of things go wrong so back to our question why is unforgiveness so common in our society why is unforgiveness so common in the church why is up for why is, it, why is it very difficult for people to forgive let me suggest to you that for you to be able to know forgiveness is very difficult. People find it very difficult to forgive because we do not want to give up that feeling of power that we have over somebody. When you have some, when somebody has wronged you and that person knows that they have wronged you and you know that that person has wronged you, it has a kind of a power over that person because every minute of the day you can remind that person that's what you did this time, that's what you did this time. You can always keep that person on the defensive. That's one of the reasons why people don't forgive. Number two, people don't forgive because it gives them a feeling of righteousness. You wronged me, I am better. I am the one who is righteous. You are the sinner here. You are the terrible one. And that is why they continue to do it. And this happens especially in most in marriages and relationships. Say you catch one of the you catch one of the uh, one of the partners involved in a particular sexual or whatever activity, and then the other one knows about it and they refuse to divorce, but every day you keep telling that's what you did. There you are now looking at those women again, that's what you did. Now you are now spending the money. That's how you spend all our money. Now, I mean, you keep reminding that person. You keep letting them know you are the terrible one in this particular marriage. I am not the one. I'm the good guy. You are the bad guy. So that's why people don't forget. People don't forget because it gives them leverage. It gives them leverage. In other words, they can use it as a bargaining chip. If you can do X, Y, and they're dead, you should not be complaining when I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Okay? People do not forgive because it gives them a, a satisfaction of revenge. They are looking for an opportunity to make that person suffer. They are looking for an opportunity to make sure that the other person does not enjoy the life that they are supposed to enjoy. People do not forgive because it's a convenient excuse. Why did you come out late? After all, you have been coming late all the time. Why did you spend the money? After all, you emptied the bank. Why are you talking to that man? After all, you talk to that woman. You know, it's an excuse to do the things that we want to do. It's an excuse to live the way we want to live. That is why we do not forgive. We do not forgive because we see it as a sign of weakness. Somebody does something bad towards you. Somebody have offended you. You feel that if you let, if you forgive that person, you are indulging that person. That you are the weak one. And if you want to be strong, you have to hold your ground. And that is what is killing a lot of relationship in our community today. People do not forgive because they see it as a sign of weakness. And most importantly, people do not forgive because they lack the understanding of the effect of unforgiveness in their own individual life. So we see. We talk about forgiveness a lot in the church, but many don't really understand it. And before you can truly forgive, before you can truly let go of something, you must understand what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. If you don't understand the difference, you will continue to confuse it and you will not be able to forgive. If you are truly going to forgive, you must know what, well, what forgiveness is not. And forgiveness, number one, is not excusing the wrongdoing of the other person. In other words, somebody has done something wrong to you. Forgiving that person does not mean that you are excusing that person's behavior. You are simply saying, in spite of your bad behavior, I am willing to let go. And that's why the Bible tells us that while we are yet sinners, Christ did what? Christ died for us. He did not die for us because we are good. He died for us even knowing that we are going to nail him to the cross. So forgiveness is not excusing wrongdoing. Forgiveness is not denying reality. It's not denying that something evil has not happened. It's not denying that you have not been, off that you have not been offended. It's not denying that you have not been hurt. It is simply saying, in spite of the offense, in spite of the denial, in spite of the anger, in spite of the pain that you have caused me, I am willing to let go. So the forgiveness is not acting, the, it's not docile tolerance. In other words, it does not mean that you are willing to accept any crap that anybody did to you. That's not forgiveness. But forgiveness is saying, I know that you are doing all these things, but I'm not going to be tied down by your own action. Forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. Please understand that. The fact that I forgive somebody does not mean that that person becomes my best buddy. Please understand that. The fact that I forgive somebody does not mean that we are going to now begin to have lunch together. I forgive somebody does not mean that you are not going to be the person that I will be my BFF. No. Forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. Forgiveness is not forgetting. The fact that I forgive you does not mean that I forgot the things that you did to me. The fact that I forgive you does not mean that I forget, I forget that you are a selfish human being. 
The fact that I forgive you does not mean that I forget that you have caused me a lot of pain. Forgiveness is not forgetting. And forgiveness is not based on the actions of other people. So you do not get, you do not give forgiveness to people because they ask you. Or you, or you say, unless you ask me, I will not forgive you. Forgiveness is not based on the action of the other person. The forgiveness is not for the sake of the other person. Forgiveness is actually for your own sake. It's for your own well-being. So forgiveness is not, if, if forgiveness is not all about all those things, uh, what then is forgiveness? And before I get into that, I want you to understand one thing. Because the enemy knows that we hold on to unforgiveness, he uses that particular sin to be able to tie us down. So forgiveness is not about tolerance. Is you know in the face of evil, forgiveness is not what is what the enemy uses. Unforgiveness is what the enemy uses to be able to have access into our life. It's what he uses to be able to build a strong goal in our life. So if unforgiveness is not if, if forgiveness is not excusing sin, if it is not you know denying reality, if it is not reconciliation, what is forgiveness? Let's go back to it. Forgiveness number one is a conscious decision. Just like unforgiveness is a conscious decision, you make up your mind. You see the reality. Yes, you stole from me. Yes, you cheated me. Yes, you hurt me. Yes, you did things to destroy me. In spite of all these things, I'm willing to let it go. It's a decision that you make. Number two, so forgiveness is a cultivated attitude. Okay? It's an attitude of the heart. It's a settled way of thinking. It's a way that you say, I know how I'm feeling about this. I know how I want to react about this thing, but I'm making up my mind that that's not the way I'm going to react. That is not the way I'm going to take this thing. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's a cultivated attitude. It's a discipline that you develop. Not only that, it's a determination to let go. You say, yes, I know it is hurting me. I know it is not what the whole world will say. In the place, in the, in the neck of the country where I come from, they refer to people who let things go easily as mumu. That means they are fools. I know it's a foolish thing, but I'm still going to let it go. So, determination to let go, that's what forgiveness is. Determination is a disciplined effort. Disciplined effort in the sense that when you see that person that you are letting go, when you see that person that you are forgiving, and they are still behaving the same way, there is a tendency for you to say, I need to whack this guy and let him know that they have done something bad. I need to make sure that evil fall upon them, that the heavens open and fire come down and swallow them, and the earth open like Korah, and Abera, and they swallowed up, that their leg will just be broken on the road as they are crossing. You wish them all sorts of evil, but when you forgive, it's a disciplined effort to say, don't, that is how I feel. I'm willing to let this guy go. It is not easy, but that is what the Lord demands of all. It's a difficult process. Forgiveness is difficult. If anybody tells you otherwise, that person probably does not know how to forgive or doesn't even know what he's talking about. It's a difficult process. Forgiveness is not an event. It's not something that happened once. Forgiveness takes time. And that is why it's a process. That's why it is difficult. You let go. You don't let go overnight because a lot of things were done to your spirit to hurt you. And then you say, I want to let this thing go. It's a process and it's a difficult one. In other words, forgiveness is hard. It is not what comes to us naturally. Our human nature does not want to let go. Our tendency is to hold on. Our tendency is to be reminded of it. Our tendency is to build a monument to that thing. Every day, in the neck of the wood where we come from, when we wake up in the morning, our fathers will put a gogoro in the bottle and they'll pour and say, my fathers, this is what I'm doing today. That is what we want to do to our forgiveness. We want to continue to pour libation to that particular altar and continue to remind ourselves that see what this person did? We need to be able to commit and remind ourselves so that we can punish them. That is what our natural self wants to do. But, he, you know, we refuse to let go. And the devil knows this. And the enemy will continue to encourage you. Why do you want to let him go? Eh? He takes you for a fool. He will do it again. He will do something worse. You need to break his leg. You need to cut his teeth. And we even have a saying where we come from. If somebody, if a chicken spoils my teeth, I will kill all, I will destroy all his heads. That is the system. We, 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 we do an eye for an eye. That is the system that we are used to. That is what our body is used to. And the enemy continues to egg you on, to continue to encourage you to do that. And the more you do it, the more you are enslaved to the process. Okay? So forgiveness is when you refuse. And it has an impact upon your life. Unforgiveness has an impact upon your life. The question is, what does it do to you? 
What does unforgiveness do to you? Number one, unforgiveness robs you of the blessings of God. Look at the verse of scripture we read in the morning. Verse number 10, in, in, verse, in Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse number 15, the Bible says, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. You are asking God, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. The Bible says that when you are praying and you remember that you have a problem with your brother, it says stop that prayer, go and settle with that guy, and then come back and pray. Because if you do not deal with the spirit of unforgiveness, it will rob you of the blessings of God. Number two, unforgiveness blocks the flow of the blessings from heaven. Number three, unforgiveness holds you captive. Because anytime you see the guy that has done something that has offended you, something just starts churning inside your stomach. I don't know whether you've ever felt that before, but you look at somebody and everything inside of you starts going out of shape. You know, your body starts, it's like you can see the person and just... <clears throat> if you have the power, I used to say if I have that power, you know, if I were God for one day... God will help us. <laughs> but let's leave that one alone. You see, that tells you God is working. Still, he's still doing some work inside of me. You know? You know when Jesus said, turn the other cheek? I tried, you know? I'm still trying. The only thing is that instead of turning the other cheek, I make sure I stay away from your hands touching me in the first place so that I won't turn the other cheek. But that's a story for another day. So how forgiveness holds you captive. Because the longer you hold on to that thing, the more you are the captive of the person that create that kind of behavior, that kind of response inside of you. Unforgiveness holds you captive. Unforgiveness, you know, unforgiveness chains you to the source of your hurt. It chains you to that person, that particular individual, that particular society, that particular community, that particular race. Anytime you see them, something inside of you is triggered and you are chained to that particular thing. You continue to relieve the experience if you refuse to let go. Please understand what I said. I'm not saying this thing is easy. I'm not saying you forget. I'm only saying that when you forgive, you refuse to allow yourself to, be, to relieve the entire process all over again. You refuse to allow yourself to be a victim all over again. You refuse to allow yourself to, become under, to come under the control of that particular person again. Unforgiveness costs you more than you realize. There are research that have been done that unforgiveness affects your physical health. It affects your healing. It affects your emotion. It affects your psycho, your psyche. It affects everything around you. Unforgiveness costs you more than you risk, than you, than you, than you, than you, than you bargain for. And seeing the cost of unforgiveness, why then must you release? Why then must you forgive? Very quickly, we must forgive because the Bible told us to forgive. God commands you to forgive. Jesus Christ, when he was teaching his people to pray, he taught them specifically. He said, forgive us our debt as we forgive those who sin against us. There's a condition there. So we are commanded to forgive. That's why we must forgive. Number two, you, you know, because you yourself have enjoyed forgiveness, that's why you forgive. Number three, because if you want to be forgiven, you have to be able to learn to forgive. Number four, because your life depends upon that particular forgiveness. Your life depends on it. That is how, that is why you must forgive. And, you know, now that you know what, what, what it means to, well, now, now that you know why you must forgive, the question is how do you forgive? How do you forgive people? Number one, you forgive people quickly. When the offense happened, the Bible says you should be angry but do not sin. Say, let not the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, you have a right to be angry. You have a right to be pissed off. You have a right to be disappointed. But he said, do it quickly. Let it go. Because the longer you build a castle for that particular unforgiveness, all sorts of things begin to crop, 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 you know, all sorts of things begin to come into that place. All sorts of uh, creeping animal begin to come into that life. You forgive. How do you forgive? Forgive very quickly. Number two, forgive completely. Don't forgive with a condition. If you come to me, then I'll let it go. If you stop doing this, then I will let it go. No, forgive completely. Make up your mind that you are not going to relive that experience again. Forgive intentionally. Make up your mind that, yes, I know this thing is there, but I'm not going to react to it the same way. You forgive unsolicited. In other words, don't wait for the guy to come to you before you forgive. Let them go. 
What I'm saying now might sound easy, but it's not easy. It is not easy to forgive very quickly because everything inside of you don't want to let go. It is not easy for you to forgive completely because you want to have a leverage. It is not easy to forgive intentionally because inside of you, you still want to be able to maintain a level of hold upon that individual. It is not very easy for you to forgive when that person has not even asked you to forgive. Okay? And that is why, as long as you remain in an a situation of unforgiveness, the enemy continues to hold on to you. The question then is that, how do you pull down the stronghold of unforgiveness in your own life? How do you put it, how do you pull it down? How do you make sure the enemy does not build a castle of unforgiveness in your head? Such that you are tied down and you cannot make progress. How do you break down the stronghold of unforgiveness? Number one, the man who will break down the stronghold of unforgiveness is the one who does not want to seek revenge. Because as long as you are looking for the hurt of the other person, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. You stole from me, I will steal from you. You mess me up, I will mess you up double. As long as you do not want to, you are not seeking revenge, as long as you give up revenge, it is very easy for you to pull down that particular stronghold. Because if you have no, if you are not seeking any revenge, the enemy cannot use that as a weapon against you. There's a preacher that always says that he said, if I go any place and somebody wants to kill me with a drink, he said that person has made a mistake because I don't drink. If you want to kill me with women, I don't, I don't run after another man's wife, so you can't walk. If you want to kill me with a particular, there are certain things you cannot kill me with because I don't do them. The enemy cannot get me with unforgiveness because if I don't seek revenge, how is he going to get it? He has nothing. That's why Jesus Christ said, the prince of this world came and found nothing in me. In other words, I live my life in such a way that I do not give the enemy the opportunity or the foothold to be able to build a castle in my head. Okay? Somebody said that you cannot stop the birds of prey from flying over your head, you know, from flying over your head. Say the only thing you can do is to make sure they do not build a nest in your head. And for people like us who have nothing, good for us. <laughs> There's nothing for them to build. The point I'm making is that do, when you give up on revenge, when you give up on getting even, it is difficult for the enemy to build a stronghold of unforgiveness in your life. Number two, when you have no pretense, when you are not under any illusion, you are not saying, yes, uh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. When inside of you, it really matters. When inside of you, you are hurting. When inside of you, you want to get your way. You know, as long as there's no pretense, you are able to say, Lord, this thing is paining me. Just like our brother told us during the time of our live class this morning. He said, express your anger. Express your emotion. Express your feeling to the Almighty God. When you are angry, say, Lord, I am angry. There are some people that want to work from here till tomorrow. You know? There are some people that I really want to deal with. I need your help. That is what David normally say. David said, my enemies are stronger than me. That's why I want you to break their leg. That, you know, you have to, you, 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 there is no pretense. When you express, when you are not under any illusion of the danger that you have faced or that, of the wrong that you have experienced, it is easy for you to let go. When you come to terms with the reality that you are facing, a man who will pull down the strong gold of the enemy, the stronghold of unforgiveness, is a man who is constantly seeking peace in his life and seeking peace between him and God. Because if you want to have peace of mind, you don't have time to hold on to any other person. You don't have time to gossip about them. You don't have time to relieve the pain that they have caused you. If you want to have peace with God, you don't have time to hold grudge against another one. Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. If your desire is to see God, you don't have time to hold grudge against another person. And not only that, a man who will pull down the stronghold of unforgiveness is the person who is ready to bear the cost of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is expensive. Forgiveness is painful. Forgiveness is a very, very difficult thing. And the person who will pull down the stronghold that the enemy is trying to build in the church, trying to build in the family, trying to build the life of an individual, that person must be ready to bear that cost of unforgiveness. Because somebody is going to laugh at you. People are going to ridicule you. The person that you are forgiving will even come to your face and say, you are stupid for forgiving me. They will say things that will make you begin to wonder, am I an idiot for allowing this person to go free? Is it sometimes better that you chop off their head so that they stop, be, they stop ridiculing you? It's a cost of forgiveness, and you must be ready to bear that cost if you are willing to pull down the stronghold of unforgiveness. Until we are ready to give up our rights, 
which we are ready to give up on our anger and our bitterness. Pulling down stronghold will be an illusion. And the man who will successfully pull down the stronghold must be ready to say, I am dead to Christ and I'm ready to be able to bear this particular burden. In closing, I want us to read the book of Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43, reading from verse number 18, the Bible says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts. The Lord is saying, remember not the former things. In other words, let go. In other words, consider the things of old, the things that have been done against you. Say, stop considering them. Say, because I will do a new thing for you. But like all promises of the Almighty God, they always come with a condition. Okay? They come with a condition. There's a conditional offer here. If you want the new thing that the Lord Almighty is promising, if you want the new place the Lord is taking you, if you want the new experience that God wants to give you, the Lord first of all tells you, you first of all have to forget about the old things. He said the same thing in Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. He said, now this is the, he said, now Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. He said, go now forward. In other words, forget about the things of the past if you want to possess your promised land. Isaiah is saying the same thing. If you want to be able to enjoy the new things that I'm about to give you, you need to forget about the things of the past. The hurt of the past. The pains of the past. The disappointment of the past. The things that family members have done. The things that friends and husbands and wife and children have done in the past that has held us captive. If you are going to experience the new wave of the church of the almighty God, you must be willing to let it go. Must be willing to let it go. This morning, the question is, are you willing to experience the new thing that God will have in store for you? Are you willing to pull down the strong gold so that you can begin to step into the newness of life? If that is your decision, I want you to bow your head and talk to the almighty God.